Welcome to the Tom Hartman University Book Club. Today we're reading from the last hours of ancient sunlight. With few exceptions, but this is page 176. With few exceptions, most Native American cultures did not have our notions as part of their collective mythos. Instead of the story that we're separate from creation and born to nominate it, these older cultures held a different view of the place of humans in the order of creation. They believe we are part of the world. We are made of the same flesh as other animals. We eat the same plants. We share the same air, water, soil, and food with every other life form on the planet. We are born into life by the same means as other mammals, and when we die like them, we become part of the soil that will nourish future generations. They also believe it is our destiny to cooperate with the rest of creation. Every life form has its special purpose in the grand ecosystem, and all are to be respected, they believed. Each animal and plant has its own unique intelligence and spirit. We are permitted to compete with other plants and animals, but we may not wantonly destroy them. All life is absolutely as sacred as human life. Although hunting and killing for food are part of nature's order, when we do so, it must be done with respect and thankfulness. Older cultures are most often cooperators, not dominators. There are human cultures who do not engage in the destruction of the world. They demonstrate that destruction and domination are not an inevitable part of human nature. Prior to the emergence of younger cultures about 7,000 years ago, the anthropological record shows that not one culture believed itself to be separate from and superior to nature. We find the remnants of these older cultures and tribal people around the world, such as the San, the Kogi, the Ik of uh, Uganda, the Navajo, the Hopi, the Cree, the Ojibwa, living in harmony with the world around them, the people around them, and seeing all life as sacred. The San Bushmen don't even qualify as Stone Age, since they've never used stone implements, only tools made from wood. And yet they were su su successfully pursuing their way of life 40,000 years before Aristotle, and they still are. They, are, they leave behind few traces as they are such masters of resource management. That's sustainability. And contrary to the stories of our culture, it was and is often a happy and comfortable life. When we lived like that thousands of years ago, we enjoyed cradle-to-grave security. The tribe took care of itself. We cared for one of another. If anybody had food, everybody had food. If anybody had a diseased child or an infirm parent, everybody had a diseased child or an infirm parent. The measure of wealth in such societies was security. Medians of exchange like money were unnecessary. The idea of hoarding food or other things was unthinkable because everybody was responsible for everybody. Our ancient ancestors lived in the way of all other cooperator societies in nature, but be they the society of wolves or chimpanzees or prairie dogs, they looked out for one another. Our ancestors, people like you and me of all races and all continents, lived like this all over the world for, for 40 to 200,000 years, depending on whose archaeology you accept. And then there were eruptions among traditional cultures. In some parts of the world, pe people began to move away from their hunting and gathering lifestyle by experimenting with agriculture. This created more efficient food production, thus increasing their numbers and giving some people the ability to hoard food, the beginning of what we call wealth. Then a subgroup of the agriculturalists began experimenting with a new cultural idea of coercive or forced evangelism, of bringing others into their culture in a way that had never been done before. Their gods told me that if they did, told them that if they didn't, if they couldn't evangelize others, then they should utterly destroy them. They were they they were a very few, perhaps probably not more than a dozen tribes, which rose out of the tens of thousands of tribes that populated the planet. And this small number of tribes proceeded to wipe out and displace and destroy the thousands of other tribes who were living in a sustainable, peaceful, and connected to nature way. They left the garden and began to create dominating city states and then empires. They were the first people infected with Wetiko, the origin of our younger culture. And because of this, they had become more efficient at increasing their own numbers. They had more sunlight under their own personal control. Of course, there was a price to pay for this. While the San, Kogi, Ik, and other native peoples have, may spend less than two to four hours a day gathering food and attending to the needs of life, and due to this day, by the way, in younger culture societies, this balance was radically shifted as average people must work longer and harder just to survive. Those who were the dominating individuals in the culture, however, could live luxuriously and work less and less. So for every person who only worked an hour or two a day, another person would have to work four or eight or ten hours a day or more. Without massive exploitation of resources or theft from others, for every person with ten times as much wealth, ten people must have only one-tenth as much. 
social and economic classes were born, and the first governments came into being to define, order, and control the socioeconomic structure and help the wealthy maintain and increase their riches. Whether they knew it or not, these governments, mostly kingdoms in the early days, transmitted younger culture values to all citizens, rich and poor. The power brokers of this, pro, uh, of this time programmed the consciousness of their subjects, just as our governments, educational institutions, and mass media do today. Nobody knows what brought about the first eruption of Wetsuko cultural insanity, but logic suggests it was most likely happened in places where food resources were only cyclically abundant. For example, the Tinglet and Weida Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest in the area around Vancouver Island were apparently extensive traders and owners of slaves. And this was because they could store food. This, this is where it all began, beginning wealth. Anyhow, the book is The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. This is just the, the, a, a small dip into it.